Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our quickly audible uh, webinar on corn intercropping. So there are a few of you that signed up for a sod seed webinar, but sadly, due to the incoming storm, uh, <laughs> some of our panelists, myself in included, were uh, pretty busy getting cows ready um, for this weather coming in Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, well, I guess Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, so anyway, we thought it was a really good opportunity. We get asked about corn intercropping all the time, and we did a trial this summer um, with a couple of guys that are on here tonight um, and thought it would be a good opportunity to share some data and then talk about uh, the trials that we're doing this summer on uh, a pretty large scale that we're excited about. So without further ado, we will, uh, we will get into it here. All right, so uh, we got a few criteria for questions here. Um, of course, we're going to give away a jacket to uh, either the best question or uh, the first person to update me on a Jays victory against the Yankees tonight. I know it's in the sixth inning and they are winning. So feel free to drop questions or the Blue Jays score in the chat. That would be very much appreciated. Of course, uh, ask questions as we go. Um, so you don't forget, drop it in the, the chat box and the, the panelists, the guys are going to stay on till the very end. And we're going to have a bit of a question period at the end. So drop your questions in the, I think it's Q&A and not the chat. Uh, and don't forget the Blue Jays score. Thank you very much. Um, so tonight we got a condensed panel um, just because I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about both our 2021 research and our 2022 research going forward. Um, but also on the panel tonight, other than myself, is uh, Kerwin Keller from Lang Ruth. Kerwin's a cattle farmer. Um, he did a corn intercropping trial for us this year that you guys are going to hear about. Um, and my good friend Mitch DeCoss, a neighbor of mine who has been corn intercropping for, I guess, three years now um, and did a, a corn population intercrop trial for us this summer as well. So we're going to get to hear about their experiences, both with the trial. Um, what they've done in the past as far as intercropping and then the the fun thing that we're all here to talk about where we're going with corn intercropping in the future and i will be discussing as well our 2022 um uh farm on farm research with uh corn hairy vetch and forage soybeans so stay tuned for all of this so I'm just going to get into really quick um, kind of the concept of corn intercropping, the opportunity available, and my own personal story, how I got into um, intercropping corn. So yeah, just some quick benefits, uh, obviously the extended grazing. So most of the people on here, <laughs> I actually know now and or have some form of relationship with, and they are uh, either cattle farms or mixed grain and cattle farms, which is excellent. I honestly see the most potential um, with inserting livestock in a corn intercropping situation, um, increased protein, so increased protein for cattle feed, but also increased nitrogen to um, start talking about reducing inputs on the corn. And what we talk about, if you are new to this podcast all the time is, or podcast webinar, um, is balancing the seed end ratio using plants to uh, feed the soil biology with a balanced carbon and nitrogen source and the benefits that come with that, which of course sits stable soil aggregates and a functioning soil, a soil that can infiltrate air, water, nitrogen, um, and give the biology access for the micronutrients that those plants need to, to survive. So this was the, actually the first corn intercrop that I ever did. I think this is either 2018 or 2017. Um, I've been doing this for long enough. Uh, so this is kind of what we see. So the corn was sown at the same time, or the peri vetch was sown at the same time as the corn. Nothing fancy. The corn was sown with a, a plant, 30 inch planter. I sowed the hairy vetch and put down fertilizer with an 8,800 Borgo drill. So the corn for a long time, you think the hairy vetch um, either isn't there or isn't germinated or definitely isn't established and good enough. Um, but it just uh, establishing takes time on the hairy vetch and it's a good opportunity to get the corn to jump ahead of the hairy vetch. So we're not worried about um, competing for sunlight, which is so important. So this is two days later. These photos go in pretty tight succession here because the change is quite rapid. But on the 27th of June, uh, in my brain, I was thinking this was uh, not a complete crop failure, just 
a waste of 10 pounds of hairy vetch seeds or whatever I put down here. I honestly can't remember the exact specifics, but this was about what it looked like on the 27th of June. On the 2nd of July, we really started to see some change happening here. So the corn was, um, you know, about not quite waist high, the uh, maybe between knee and waist high, the hairy vetch was starting to get established and you could see it was become uh, covering more of the soil. And by the 6th of July, this was actually the last rain we had on this year. You can see the corn has jumped, but the, the hairy vetch has filled in significantly. Um, you can see that the hairy vetch is not competing with the corn at all for sunlight. Uh, the corn obviously has a deeper root um, and has access to more water. So really what this hairy vetch is doing is just capturing the wasted sunlight that the corn is not. Five days later, this is generally what we see on years where we get decent precipitation with hairy vetches. Once that corn has closed in that canopy, it creates almost a microclimate. And the vetch being a cool season plant and really doesn't like direct sunlight, the corn has now created an environment that the vetch absolutely thrives in, which is cool, not direct sunlight. Vetch is a low carbon, high nitrogen um, plant, so it really does not have need for high, high amounts of carbon. And then that is why um, it's kind of evolved that way without an upright plant physiology, it grows along the ground and in vines um, accessing sunlight where it can. And this is a really good picture describing exactly what I just talked about, which is, of course, the vetch is not competing with the, with the corn at all for sunlight. Really, you can see those blotches of sunlight and, and that is just wasted sunlight the corn was not going to utilize that was going to heat up the soil um, and bounce back. Well, now we have a plant there to capture that wasted energy, but also feed that system, balance that seed and in the soil, feed that microbiology that's feeding um, your plant. And this is the 25th of September. So we kind of ran out of moisture that year, but this was the mat of um, hairy vetch that we had on the ground. An interesting story uh, on a sprayer pass where I had turned a corner and sprayed uh, you know, a significant amount of glyphosate on the vetch where there was not any. On a hot day in July, it was like 100 Fahrenheit, my temperature probe put uh, the soil surface. I went under that mat of hairy vetch, pulled the vetch back, took a temperature probe, and it was 70 degrees, you know, exactly room temperature. So, you know, people say, well, we're taking from the corn because like that vetch has to use some moisture. But I think an equally interesting conversation piece is how much moisture are we saving by reducing evaporation and the sun hitting and heating up um, our soil. So, of course, very interesting. And the guys are going to talk about this yet tonight. Uh, something we uh, took me a little while, took me about four years to observe this about, but some years the hairy vetch was really good in the corn, some years not so much. But um, finally, I had the realization walking through a cornfield a couple of years ago, uh, north-south. This was at 1.30 in the afternoon. At 1.30 in the afternoon, sunlight was shining right down those north-south rows. And although vetch doesn't have a high sunlight need, it, you know, takes more sunlight than what's offered on the left side. So in east-west row, when that sun's at the highest point in the sky, that sunlight has to penetrate, you know, two, maybe three rows of corn before that sunlight can hit the surface. As you can see on the left, it shows up in blotches. On the right, at least once a day, we get sunlight shining right down those corn rows and feeding uh, that, that vetch or that corn intercrop. So a very important thing to remember when, when sowing a corn intercrop is make sure you're sowing it north to south. So I get it asked all the time, farm sowing at v5 so this was hairy vetch that was sown at the same time as the corn but i really just wanted to show more the growth of the corn so if we're broadcasting uh intercrop at v5 in the corn you know seed to soil contact is not great we're waiting on a rain so before that that seed can get germinated and actually established to the point where it can capture a significant amount of photosynthetic energy sunlight um you know that's going to take three weeks or a month well three weeks to a month of growth in a corn crop in July probably means three to four feet of growth. And by the time we hit that three to four feet of growth, the corn has captured so much of the sunlight that the, the plants below don't have a chance to establish themselves. So um, it's not that we have seen zero success. So um, Dan Fox, uh, I think this is a Tom Leppelman's field. 
Um, Dan Fox sent me this picture. He's Tom's agronomist. But they did have some success um, broadcasting some turnips and some radish into corn at B5. So I don't want to say it doesn't work at all. Um, but something to remember is 96% of a plant is uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So that's sunlight and water. So if we are already, you know, we're broadcasting something um, into a, a plant stand that's going to be six feet tall, well, likely that uh, six foot tall plant has the run of sunlight and it'll root deeper. So it'll access more moisture. So when we're putting a plant um, in that scenario, we just have to remember that, uh, you know, to limit expectations because it takes some pretty ideal conditions for to, to, to see growth like this. And herbicide management, so with hairy vetch and forage soybeans, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit later in our 2022 trials, we're trying to make it as adaptable as possible for farms. So um, it hairy vetch is glyphosate tolerant to a certain extent. So what we say is three quarters REL, um, a relative leader or an old leader, or 300 grams um, per pass. And you want to spread your herbicide passes out a couple of weeks to give the chance, the vetch a chance to reestablish itself. Um, but at that rate, it does damage the vetch, but unless you're doubling up, like I say, turning a corner, generally the hairy vetch is fine. And the big, the, honestly, the biggest limiting factor at that point is moisture. Are we going to get precipitation, you know, July and August, um, when conditions are ideal for that vetch to, to really gain some vetch biomass, um, and, and feed that system. So harvest observations, I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time on this because we're going to talk about this um, with the with the panelists. But yeah, there, we see uh, vetch intercrop. It's getting very, very popular with corn. Um, and what can you do at harvest time? So of course, there's corn grazing and vetch is a very nice option because low protein corn, high protein, very palatable vetch. It works out really good. It's another energy source for animals that are otherwise just eating corn or corn stalks. Um, corn silage, the vetch, if the growth is really good, um, can be an issue for uh, corn silagers. But what I say and what what farms generally do is they just pick the harvester up. So they're getting, you know, six inches less of corn stalk, which likely your cow is not going to be able to digest anyway. Um, and then it gives uh, you an option to come back and graze bio plant biomass after um, taking a silage corn silage crop where normally it's sticks and black top soil. And the third option, which I think there's the most potential for, and what you see in this picture is um, growing a corn intercrop with a cash crop corn, harvesting the corn, of course, for cash uh, to sell in the commodity market and utilizing the protein in the cover crops to extend the grazing, extend the value of the high carbon residue, which is uh, the corn stover. So we've seen uh, lots of potential in this. I'm Mitch, one of the panelists tonight is going to chat about it. And um, yeah, we can run through some of the numbers as far as what this system um, can add as far as dollars per acre with current feed costs, um, how much money, uh, not that they're going to cut you a check for grazing cattle on your land, but how much cost savings as far as savings on winter feed, savings on a manure bill, um, time, depreciation, you know, repair and maintenance, fuel cost. Um, if we can extend that grazing season, you know, we can really talk about saving some real money as far as um, winter feed for cattle. And then what the guys are here to talk about today and what we're gonna answer questions on um, is our 2021 research trials. So we were very fortunate to partner with General Mills and the University of Manitoba. Um, sadly, it was just, it was 2021. And as you'll find out from the guys, everywhere we trialed this, the three locations had horrendous droughts. Um, but we did have some uh, interesting observations and get to see what this system, uh, how it works under stress conditions. Um, and then we did get some precipitation in the fall. So that was pretty interesting as well. But the goal of the trial uh, was utilize properties of corn, which are tall growing, high carbon, high biomass with a low light, highly vegetative legume capturing unused sunlight. So what we talked about before, that sunlight, the corn doesn't capture. We have a plant down below to capture that sunlight and utilize that sunlight. Um, and then higher sunlight to water efficiently, efficiency, improve soil aggregates and balance the carbon to nitrogen. Um, the goal is, sorry, I got my screen in the way here. The goal is to figure out the best plant population of corn per acre to achieve a crop that is a 50% corn biomass and a 50% 
um, highly digestible hairy vetch uh, biomass. So instead of having a corn crop that's, you know, 7% protein and a lot of high lignin corn stalks, we're hoping to get a more digestible plant biomass, um, you know, that maybe can come in at 10, 12, 13% protein and, and a more digestible feedstuff for cattle. And the treatment, so uh, corn, hairy vetch, and originally we had uh, flax in the intercrop that, that didn't happen, uh, will be planted at four target densities, corn densities, so 32,000 uh, plants, 18,000 plants, 12,000 plants, and 8,000 plants. So I should say this is all with an air seeder uh, down the exact same tube, sown at the exact same depth um, with the same fertilizer rates. So uh, in a small plot experiment, there will be no intercrop control treatment um, at each of the four densities. So what that means is there was just a monocrop option to the side that we could compare uh, these trials with. So Kerwin, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, so I've known Ker Kerwin for a few years. Um, he's come down and visited. We've talked lots about cattle. Kerwin was kind enough to do a corn intercrop trial for us. Uh, last year, um, and we got some really cool pictures and some uh, some grazing information. So, Kerwin, why don't you tell us about yourself, your farm, um, and kind of how and why you got interested in corn intercropping? Okay, yeah. Can you hear me all right here? You got it. You sound great. Okay, hey, sounds good. Yeah. So I run, uh, or we run a four hundred cow calf operation here at Langers, Manitoba, and um, um, yeah with my wife and my two boys and I uh, have a partner on the side that as well, he runs carpentry business, but he's on the farm here as well as what he helps. His name is Rick Buchert. And we um, kind of got interested in the corn vetch thing after, I don't know, I just got watching videos and how the intercropping kind of looked interesting and kind of watching a lot of Gabe Brown videos, I guess, on YouTube, but <laughs> you and everyone got... else on this, on this webinar, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, we mainly stick to the cow calf. We don't do a lot of grain. So we, we have grazed corn vetch. Um, 2020, we grazed 160 acres. I guess we did chop 80 acres out of that. And it was kind of a mixed feeling thing, I guess. It, I like the corn vetch but the chopper guys didn't. So, <laughs> so that kind of, kind of, I guess I hesitated a little bit going in forward to the next year on the chopping corn for vetch. But if a person is grazing it, I think it's a great um, ratio for your protein and um, your energy base. Um, what I found one thing is the cows didn't overload or like they didn't get acidosis nearly as easy. That was one big, eye opener to me so but yeah no that's and, and we experienced it, we experienced the same thing yeah great great introduction Kerwin so you like uh you probably had it worse than we did down here but why don't you just talk about um kind of the growing season as it was um and the drought and kind of how the plants reacted yeah so last summer as probably most of everybody knows it was a horrendous drought of course um as you can see the pictures there, we swathed our corn for when we chopped it, actually we just used a pickup header on a chopper and chopped it because it was just much faster. We weren't going to run up and down the rows, three rows at a time and chop that. So um, I sent that first picture there without the swather there to Joe in the middle of summer and just showed him kind of what the corn was looking like. And that was the middle of July and it was kind of pretty discouraging. So that was kind of on our higher, drier, sandier, field i guess we did have some better corn along we along the marsh and stuff so which i think kind of saved us through this winter so but yeah other than that it was pretty pretty dry yeah i think that that looks tougher kerwin than even <laughs> what we experienced i don't think my corn at any point looked like that um no like i've never i've never had our corn rope for like three weeks in a row and it that's <laughs> once you once it got over a week then it started getting depressing when you see your court and starting to rope for that long and it just kept going and it kept going and you could just kind of left that field alone and walk to the next one where it looked a little better yeah <laughs> i think a lot of us were doing that this year um so this is the just uh, i'll preface this for you kerwin and then you can talk a, a little bit about kind of what you saw 
Um, you know, I, we're going to have to do this trial again this year to see how uh, these plants react when it's not in a horrendous drought. Um, you know, the goal was maximizing sunlight and, you know, it's pretty tough to maximize sunlight uh, to know plant populations for maximizing sunlight when your corn looks a lot like an onion. Um, but anyway, we learned some interesting things and, uh, you know, it's never a failure if you're learning. But uh, this was the exactly what the trial looked like. Um, that we did at your place. So you can see on the left was 8,000 plants. That's what 8,000 plants looked like in a drought. Uh, 12,000, 18,000, and 32,000 plants. Um, so Kerwin, why don't you just talk about what you seeded this with? Um, just to give some perspective, I believe it was eight pounds of hairy vetch that went with this. Um, but yeah, just talk about what you did as far as fertilizer, what you did with herbicide, and then, um, you know, what, what your observation was as far as growth and, and the plant population of the corn. Yeah, so that was, uh, I guess, the, well, that was after the picture there is after we chopped that field. Um, we cut that one all to silage, so there's a lot of bare soil there, which is doesn't look very great, but um, we did about 190 acres on that field and it was, this was kind of this trial was kind of right in the middle of the whole field so you kind of had to walk through lots of corn to get there but um the i didn't put a whole lot of fertilizer on there I, when i was fertilizing that field i put about 150 pounds total product on there after i was after i was done fertilizing that field so but there was one good observation in that that trial in the end what i really noticed was the 12,000 and 18,000, I think really thrived last summer. I don't know, the 32,000, there was a little bit too much corn, maybe just because it was seeded with an 8,800 Borgo drill. So I was, I would have probably preferred planting it, but that's what <laughs> Joe wanted us to do. I guess General Mills, I think that's what they were talking about wanting us to do. So no, but, this was Joe's brainchild. <laughs> oh, okay. My goal, my, my goal is to try and save cattle uh, farmers money to, at all costs. And I got to say, yeah. I got to shout out to my brother-in-law who is on tonight. Uh, he is a pioneer rep and me talking about seeding corn with an air seeder is like chalk or uh, nails on a chalkboard to him. So I'm sure he's plugging his ears as we speak right now. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, there was an observation when I was seeding it there. I, I noticed the only thing that I didn't like about seeding that with an 8,800 Borgo drill is I had a lot of cracks coming through my tubes, like just from the augers. Yep. So I'm guessing we're le losing seed population through that. And I don't, we probably wouldn't have if we would have planted it. Right. But yep. other, mm -hmm. all in all, in the end of the day, it, I was really impressed with that trial for how dry we were. Cause in the beginning when we planted that or seeded it with a drill, it was so dry. It was just like, that's one of some of our heavier land and it was, pretty dry going into there because we have quite a few rocks around here and it was just clumps of dirt pulling up really is what it was and you couldn't even find moisture so so Kerwin just talk about uh because I'm assuming uh, in my experience uh vetch does not like dry you know crazy dry conditions even if it does have a canopy to grow under so what did you see is like early in the year as far as vetch establishment and like when did the vetch actually come and and take off yeah so in the beginning there i i seeded it there and then i just kind of left for a little while and i came back a week later and i was like oh man this is this like i had started digging in the rows and i couldn't even find anything germinating and i was like this is going to be bad we don't get rain and like i just then i was then i was depressed so then i just left it for quite a while and <laughs> then i came back to my surprise we had got a little shot of rain which wasn't much and I came back and I was like, oh man, there's corn growing. And there's, then I started walking around it. And yeah, there was some small vetch, like it, like the vet for eight pounds an acre. I sh thought I should have maybe seen quite a bit more vetch, but I, I just told myself like it was vetch is usually takes a little while to get established for sure. And yeah, like after a while, we got a few little shots of rains and then it didn't look great the whole summer, but in the in the end of the summer then we got a few inches of rain later on when it was almost too late really for cobbing i guess but seeing this corn was planted i mean seeded lower populations and there was more room between the plants really there was huge cobs on the corn so there was no downside to that yeah 
Well, really and then you you the didn't end up... Came up. Sorry, go ahead, Kerwin. Yeah, when Kennedy came out, like I hadn't been there for a couple of weeks, and we were both like, "Wow, that actually turned out like the vet in places the vet was really thick, and there was a lot of biomass on that ground." Well, and you didn't end up silaging this. I wish this video worked. Um, this is a drone video of your cows in the uh, in the corn vetch. But why don't you just talk a little bit about what you saw as far as you know grazing? How did the cows clean it up? How long did it last? Um, you know. Maybe what you saw as, as, as far as biomass? Yeah, so we... Um, when Kennedy came there, he was... He was and got about six days out of it, the four acres. I kind of paddocked it off in three paddocks. And um, it, the last paddock got pretty muddy because it was closer to the... to a slough in the back and then we got like an inch six days obviously it had to rain so then the cows started tramping it into the ground quite a bit so we didn't they didn't eat as much then but it i wasn't discouraged because it was going into the soil and i knew it was going to be beneficial for this year so so kerwin you were breaking up breaking up a little bit there like how many cows did you have out there and how many acres was it oh sorry about that yeah no there was four acres it was a four acre trial and we had 300 pairs out there for six days is what we what I figured we got off of that. We had more feed besides that. They were on some stockpiled grass that we hadn't touched all summer as well on the side of that. So cool. Um, and just to touch on this, Kerwin, we uh, both you and I uh, talked about it, but this is just a feed analysis that uh, Kennedy sent away of the of the hairy vetch. So this is kind of where the potential comes from as far as a cow being able to balance that ration herself, um, you know, the energy and protein of the, the feedstuff that she's consuming. So, you know, the corn generally runs, I don't know, seven to 9% protein, um, where the hairy vetch, you know, uh, the sample from your field was 23.4% protein dry matter. So I imagine um, your cows <laughs> probably enjoyed that, that feed source uh, very much, probably too much. Like, honestly, it was probably too rich for them, eh? Yeah, like really, we should have grazed that in the winter time, but it was just it was it's two miles away from our yard, and we were right beside there anyhow, and we wanted to move our cows home after we were done grazing in a pasture, so we just kind of put them out there, and it was it wasn't really probably cold enough for that for that um corn vetch really to actually really benefit what we could have really got out of it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like if the if the ground stayed firm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Kerwin, I got, uh, of course, you're sticking around for uh, question and answer. We got some questions rolling in already, um, but just wanted to give you a, a little bit of time to talk about uh, what your plan is for this year, kind of uh, observations. Um, you've done this for a couple of years now, just um, kind of where your head's at. It doesn't have to be this year. Or what, what, what you kind of see as an opportunity in corn intercropping in the future. Yeah, for sure. I think um, we're definitely going to be doing more corn and vetch going forward here. I'm not sure how much we will do this year, but we do have our own chopper this year, so we don't have to listen to the custom guys complain about the vetch. So <laughs> even though it was interesting, though, when we were chopping our corn in 2021, he had to back up every time because the fingers in the rotary head would plug up with the vets, but we let the cows on there after and they cleaned it right up. So there really wasn't a waste of time, honestly, for what we got out of it for grazing. But yeah, I think we're going to experiment with a little bit more. I know Joe was talking about the soybean trial um, and that really got me thinking as well. So we're going to probably, we have about 300 acres of corn that we're going to put in this year and I'm not sure what we're all going to intercrop and what's going to go in there yet, but definitely we'll do some intercropping for sure. Cool. Well, stay tuned for the, uh, uh, for my chat about, uh, soybeans. Great job, Kerwin. Um, you can, uh, you can mute yourself and take a break for, uh, for a little bit. We'll come back to you and question and answer. All right, Mitch. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, turn your video on. So Mitch, as I was saying, is a good buddy of mine. 
Um, we do uh, <laughs> run cows through together for better or for worse. Uh, and Mitch is, uh, oh, he picked up on some of my crazy ideas like, like corn intercropping. So um, Mitch, why don't you talk about your farm, who you're farming with, your family, um, and kind of, yeah, we'll start into your, uh, a little bit, little short history of the, of how you kind of got into <clears throat> cropping and whatnot. All right. Well, I guess my wife and I in our family farm with my mom, my mom and dad and her mom and dad, we have around about 270 ish cows and farm about 2,700 acres of cropland. Um, I guess I got into the cover cropping or poly cropping probably in about 2012 we just kind of took a whole, had a whole bunch of leftover seeds sitting around and we just sowed down 10 acres with everything that we had sitting around and silaged it worked really good and we kind of carried on and snowballed from there and i blame joe for the corn and uh corn and vetch in the crop i came and helped him get his combine set up he borrowed our header to combine it and it looked like a great idea, especially when I seen his cows out grazing it. And that's kind of what got us into it. And someday I will buy my own corn uh, uh, header, but you got to charge more rent. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> that thing should do more acres anyways. <laughs> so this is actually a picture I took, Mitch, because you don't take enough pictures of your intercrops. Uh, but this is 2019, your first corn vetch intercrop. Um, yep, yep. Why don't you, you, I guess, talk about the concept and uh, I got, uh, I got kind of an information sheet, what you provided us as far as uh, what the crop was like, but why don't you just talk about the nuts and bolts, how it worked with uh, fertilizing, seeding and uh, how the planter worked in. Okay. Well, I guess that was our first year in the General Mills program and I was really struggling what I was going to put out with what I was going to put out there. So I came up with this idea. And we were, wait, we were hoping to get the um, Haney test back quicker. So I thought, well, I'm just going to go out with half the recommended, recommended fertilizer. And then we'll see what the Haney test says. And we would top dress later. So we went out with, we went in with ESN only for the nitrogen. And you got 30 pounds of actual FOSS. And I got looking back through my notes and actually, that was the year we switched over and started using uh, Power Rich. So we did a 40 pounds of a Power Rich blend for that. So we went in with our 8810 for, or <clears throat> Burgo drill and we banded that in first at about two inches. And then we went back in and put the hairy vetch in at half an inch. And then we planted the corn with 30 inch planter which was very time consuming three passes three passes <laughs> but i was worried about the nitrogen the fertilizer and the depth for the vetch and i we wanted to put the we've had good luck with the planter so that's how we wanted to put the corn in and then mitch maybe talk about <clears throat> generally what you do as far as pre-emergence burnoff and uh in crop herbicide we usually go in, we make sure we hit it hard with Roundup before we start putting in the fertilizer. <clears throat> and then we were going with about 120 grams of Roundup. In the first year, that worked great. We had amazing control and anywhere that there was weed escapes, the vetch smothered it. Just destroyed it. Like I had, a, I have a picture somewhere, I can't find it, of like a two foot high kosher plant in a drowned out spot and the vetch just swarmed it and dragged it down. And then the second year we did it, we so that was, we sowed east west the first year, or sorry, we sowed north south the first year and then we sowed east west the second year. And it wasn't really, the vetch wasn't as impressive, but we still had good weed control at that rate. But this year, this year was not, favorable we had a lot of kosher just kosher on top of kosher we couldn't stop it well yeah. hang on i i gotta i gotta i'm gonna pause you right there because we're gonna okay. we're gonna cover that in the slide here but <laughs> talk about uh kind of your strategy so you guys combine the corn which is what we do on, on our farm so if you miss anything i will <laughs> i will add some stuff but mitch i get asked all the time you got another plant growing with your corn why isn't that take 
I mean, you had half rate fertilizer and 120 bushel corn. Is that vetch not hurting your yield? Or did you see it hurt your yield? No, I don't think it did. That year, I honestly, I think it helped our yield. Because like I said, we put we didn't put very much fertilizer down with it. And we had, didn't have a whole lot residual. So I think they worked together, companion. It was a bit, it was kind of dry through the summer that year. I think the corn was pulling up moisture from down deep and the vetch was providing the nitrogen. I think they worked together and they were sharing back and forth. That's my opinion. But There's science to back that up too, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then just talk about, I know we, we discussed this beforehand. Um, we were going to put some numbers down, but just talk about you grazed it after um, what conditions were like um, roughly how many days, Mitch, and, and how did the cows like it? They love it. Um, 2019, we didn't get, it was so wet and miserable that year after the snowstorm. We kind of did it in two stretches. Uh, we did about 40 acres before I gave up and quit because the corn was too wet. And we fenced that off and they grazed that for maybe two weeks. It's tough to tell because we, that time of year, I'm scared of losing conditions. So we we're usually giving them between a quarter and a half ration of feed to go with whatever they're grazing. So we probably got a lot longer out of it than we would have if we were just pushing them. And then we went back at the start of March and we combined the rest of the corn and we turned the cows out and we pulled them off mid-April when it was starting to get too muddy and they're making a mess of the field. They probably could have stayed out there for another two weeks. But like I said, I was scared they were going to make a big mess all over the place and I didn't want to till it up. So so what do you see, Mitch, as far as like how they clean it up? Do you find residue is less of an issue um, the yeah. following year? Yes. Excuse me. In the first couple of years we grew corn, we had to basically, we had to pro-till it sometimes twice so that we could drag our 8810 through it. It was just a mess. Since we started doing the corn vetch, I can, we usually get the neighbor to come in and roll it. So we avoid the flat tires and then I can seed straight through it. I usually seed 90 degrees to how I planted it. And it's, unless it's wet, you know, early morning dew or something, it'll be a bit of a problem, but heat of the day, that stuff passes through the drill. No problem. they whatever, what's left. I mean, they basically lick the ground clean. Yeah. I have the identical drill and have had the same, same exact experience. It seems like where you, the more vets you get, actually the less issue you're going to have with residue because the cows will lick it off the ground. And the nice thing is usually they get, you know, a corn husk or a leaf or a bit of stock with it, but they will do, uh, <laughs> I was going to say unspeakable things, but they, they probably would do unspeakable things to make sure they get all that vetch cleaned up. What amazes me the most is watching them graze and you'd think you're going to deal with so many weeping eyes from eye pokes, but they still don't, they don't get those. No, we haven't had any. They're just like vacuum cleaners running down those rows. You'd think they'd stab their eyes, but they don't. Well, Mitch, uh, a question I get asked as much as anything. um, There's an article online that talks about uh, toxicity considerations uh, in the vetch. And hairy vetch prompts an allergic reaction that causes kidney failure. And in black Angus cattle, mortality can range from 50 to 100%. So my question to you is, if you're losing half your cows every year grazing vetch, why do you do it? <laughs> I don't think I've ever lost one out there. The only time we've lost any cattle grazing corn is when we actually tried grazing standing corn. But- I, I have the same experience. We have dealt with cows overloading on corn, uh, bloating on alfalfa. Literally, there would not be many days that go by on our farm where there isn't at least a cow consuming some form of hairy vetch, whether that's in a dry bale, a silage bale, or or grazing or stockpiled grazing. Uh, it's a not it's a non bloat. <laughs> we have never lost one single cow to it, and we have almost exclusively black Angus cows. And the last time I did cows at your place, uh, you seem to have a lot of black cows there as well. So I don't know where this article comes from, but we get asked it all the time. I wish I was a scientist and could uh, go out and test this, but I can tell you every single day I test this theory uh, and we've never, ever lost a cow to hairy vetch. Um, I don't know where it came from. 
if you held a gun to my head and told me I had to pick one seed um, that I could intercrop with anything, it would always be hairy vetch. It is just a phenomenal crop for, for livestock, uh, high quality livestock feed, non bloat and putting nitrogen into our system. So Mitch, this was uh, your trial. Why don't you just talk about, you're slightly different than uh, Kerwin's, just uh, kind of talk about what you saw, what observation you saw. And then I think uh, the next slide we have here is is talking about your kosher. So that's why I wanted to put a pin in that, but just talk about what you did in the trial here. Okay, we sold, we had our poly crops, our uh, silage crop on this field the year before and it regrew like mad unfortunately i didn't have a fence around it so i didn't know what to do with it come spring i was worried about a huge mess going through the drill when i came in to put uh, fertilizer on it so i actually had somebody come out and we floated on i think we did same thing half rate i always just go half rate of the soil test of esn so we floated on our esn so sorry, Mitch, I'm going to pause you there. Half rate of your soil test, your recommended soil test. Of when nitrogen. You're, when you're in a cropping vetch with your corn. Yes. Okay. And I always use ESN in the corn because the corn really isn't looking for anything until July. So I count on the ESN being available in July after it gets released. So we don't have as much gassing off or leaching away. So we floated on the nitrogen. Worked all the heavy residue in with a pro till. And then I came in. Well, then it turned cold, so I lost a week. And then we came in and put it down our 40 pounds of power rich and 10 pounds of hairy vetch into basically dust. And then the next day came in and with the planter and planted everything else. I sowed the you caught me just as I was finishing up the field and I got the corn trial in with the drill. And I have that extra 3,200 because I forgot to uh, adjust the depth. So the first 32,000 is a uh, half inch seeded corn, which don't do that. What a difference. That's amazing. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's the rest of it. But and then just what, what did you see as far as I know yours was very similar to mine, Mitch. Uh, if the drought didn't get it, uh, you know, the grasshoppers got a lot of the hairy vetch, but kind of what you saw as far as population and how the corn filled in the stand. I was not as impressed with the lighter end. The 32,000 is not bad. The 18,000 was okay, but just with the air distribution, I thought there was, you could have three seeds within six inches and then there'd be nothing for three or four feet, which I wasn't really super thrilled about that consistency. Had the vetch been better, it probably would have filled that space in and probably been really good for grazing. Yep. But the kosher grew in and that just smoked it. Like the yield was terrible. Not An ex always. excellent segue here. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is the other end of your trial um, yeah. where you went out and did uh, baleage. So, uh, you were talking about your kosher. I wanted to, <laughs> we got to talk about the, we talking about the positives, but it's good, important to talk about the negatives as well. Roundup resistant kosher is a real thing. And that is one thing when, um, you know, we're growing corn intercrop, you know, likely we're just going with, with glyphosate. So, um, just talk about what you did with, um, uh, your kind of your kosher spots, the strategy and, um, well, I guess, Spoiler, spoiler alert, the quality of your baleage. Okay. Well, I was getting worried that the kosher was probably, at least some of it was going to be Roundup resistant. I didn't want that taken off all over the place. So we put in a call to crop insurance to see if we could do alternate use on the field. And I never heard back from them, but I was already getting sick of doing kosher. You can see all our bales kind of in the distance there. Okay, yeah. So this was kind of at the tail end of doing it. We'd already done probably 900 bales. I was ready to be done. So I just tied into it. And then I just started following the kosher patches with the disc bind. Cut them all up. And I got into it. And I got thinking, you know, I'm just going to do the whole bloody field. But then crop insurance called and said they 
wouldn't, they didn't want me to do more than like 5% of the field without doing a yield check. And they weren't going to do a yield check until it had cobbed and this was still just silking. So that's why we stopped where we did, but the, we had a bit of vetch come back, a bit of kosher come back where we cut it. But we've been doing, we've been silaging off our kosher patches for years and it is always our best feed. Like they will lick the ground there. As long as you catch the kosher before it gets really big stalks, they clean that stuff up. Yeah, even, even when you get it, when there is stocks, usually the only thing left is a few stocks. stocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it does make excellent baleage, and it's a nice and option. The, and the ensiling kills the seeds, so you don't have to worry about that. So, I don't know. It's, yeah, we never hesitate to put kosher up as, as feed. Yeah. So, Mitch, let's talk about, um, you've been doing this for, what, I guess, three years now. I assume you're growing corn again this year, although I never actually really asked you. But what are you thinking as far as this year? I mean, fertilizer prices are crazy. What are you thinking as far as intercrop and uh, and fertilizer and, and, I guess, end use, whether that be grazing or combining or, or silaging? Right now we've got a field where we had a, well, a field right next to where this one was, where we had a canola disaster that has very high residual. It's an old hay field. It was a hay field two years ago. I broke it up by putting it down to rye vetch, which... Well, got written off because there was absolutely no germination. So then we caught the only rain we had in that area for the whole year. And I thought, well, maybe it's going to rain. I'm going to gamble on the high canola prices. And I went in with canola, which was an absolute disaster. But now we're sitting. You're not the only one if that makes you feel better. What's that? You're not the only one if that makes you feel better. (laughs) Now we're sitting with about 180 pounds of residual nitrogen in that field. Holy. Yeah. So we're just going to basically go and put some power rich fertilizer down and put corn into it. I wasn't planning on putting vetch in just because of the high residual. What I was thinking is maybe broadcasting or getting a plane to blow on. I was reading a bit about uh, ryegrass putting it in there just before, if it looks like we're gonna catch a rain just before canopies, get some ryegrass blown on, get it germinated, canopies in, slows down. And then when it starts to open up in the fall, it'll explode and it's hoping to get a bit of grazing out of it that way. What kind of of ryegrass, Mitch? Well, I got some PRG in the bin that never got picked up. So I guess that's what it's gonna be. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think that is a really good idea because I, I mean, it's so long establishing, um, of course, it'll be spindly little plants, but you're not after it. Uh, um, you know, the only thing you're after is it to establish a root system, take the corn off. And then, um, you know, those, those rye grasses, if we get precipitation come fall, they can be a lifesaver because September, October with moisture, it just seems those are ideal growing conditions for the, for the rye grasses, whether that's uh, Italian rye grass, annual rye grass or perennial rye grass. They are an excellent option um, to extend the, the, the fall grazing season. And that's not set in stone. I was hoping to pick your brain. If you ever slow down before seeing, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll be, the I'll, I'll go in with that. there's a better chance I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, that's good. Well, thanks, Mitch. You did a yep. great job. Stick around. I'll, I'll come back and chat with you. And, and uh, Kerwin, just tell you to take your mics and, uh, and video off. Um, I'm just going to describe quick here our 2022 research trials. Um, and then we can get into questions, of course. Um, I see some Q&A and some chats. Hopefully that means a Blue Jays victory at this point. But let's talk about soil and mycorrhizal fungi. So what we're seeing, um, or I guess what I'm seeing, I think uh, corn intercropping, of course, an excellent idea. This is what we're talking about tonight. Of course, we've been talking lots about hairy vetch and intercropping that um, and how this works. So Mitch referred to the corn rooting deep, capturing moisture, 
and uh, the hairy vetch, you know, producing nitrogen and these plants, you know, sharing these minerals and how does that work? It's mycorrhizal fungi. So both of these plants are mycorrhizal dependent, hyphae uh, dependent. They need mycorrhizal fungi to help extend the root system, access moisture, access minerals, break down minerals, and transfer minerals between um, different species of plant and different species of plant. It is the oldest living organism on planet Earth and something that we are just barely scratching the surface with in um, modern conventional agriculture. So, yeah, uh, if we can better utilize mycorrhizal fungi, really that is what we're doing with the corn vetch. Um, but there's an issue, which is, um, you know, this corn uh, at this point in July has an incredibly high nitrogen use per day. The issue is, is Terry Vetch is such a slow establisher that, you know, we're seeing this amount of growth when um, the corn has the most biggest nitrogen need. So in my head, I'm thinking, how do we close this gap? How can we get legumes established earlier that aren't going to compete with the corn um, on a sunlight level, but instead lower population, stay vegetative, capture photosynthetic energy, turn that energy into um, excess nitrogen production, and then use mycorrhizal fungi to transfer these minerals. So um, that kind of led me down this little rabbit hole. So this is our wide row corn and hairy vetch, but again, this is fertilized fully. Um, but the cattle farmer in me or the curious <laughs> uh, soil healther in me is thinking, you know, how do we, how can we improve this system? How can we make it better? And I think by making it better, it means, you know, um, putting in another plant, a forage soybean, um, a group seven forage soybean, which is an incredibly long season soybean. Uh, the advantage to that is the plant stays vegetative for longer. A vegetative plant is when, or a vegetative legume, that's when we're getting our nitrogen production. As soon as that plant um, triggers reproduction and starts flowering and producing um, the, the reproductive process starts producing seeds that plants stops forming a relationship with rhizobium bacteria and therefore stops sequestering nitrogen in the soil. So by putting a, uh, in theory, putting a long uh, season group seven, seven forage soybean, um, we can produce a large amount of plant biomass vegetative plant biomass so we can cycle nitrogen and use mycorrhizal fungi to uh, uh, transfer the, those minerals um, and make a more efficient system, one that is less dependent on synthetic N. And this is what we are trying to balance. Of course, I talk about this all the time, but we've got a high residue, high carbon, uh, low nitrogen uh, corn plant capturing photosynthetic energy, but now we put in a uh, very vegetative, low carbon, high nitrogen uh, soybean and hairy veg plant. So we can balance that C to N ratio. Of course, it's not that simple, but we can get closer to balance with that C to N ratio and feed that soil microbiology. Now that microbiology has the ability to access and make stable soil aggregates. When we have stable soil aggregates, we have pore space in the soil. When we have pore space in the soil, we can infiltrate water, we can infiltrate oxygen, we can infiltrate nitrogen, we can uh, <clears throat> give our biology more access to the minerals that build the plant. Essentially, we have a more functioning soil. So this is a, just a very general protocol of, of a very simple trial that we're trying to do on a large scale with these uh, forage soybeans and vetch. So basically we go into a monocrop cornfield, 32,000 plants, um, on 30 inches, of course, so north to south, as we discussed uh, this evening, um, and then go in with a five acre trial of uh, five pounds of hairy vetch, 20 pounds uh, to the acre of forage soybeans. So that is um, any time around corn seeding time, but after the 20th of May. So if you're seeding your corn on the 25th of May, sow the soybeans and the vetch at the same time. If you're sowing your corn on the 10th of May, well, we're just going to wait about uh, 10 or 15 days before putting the forage soybeans in because uh, they are uh, zero frost tolerance. So we just want to make sure that we're going to avoid that late May frost. Um, as far as fertilizer and herbicide, we're going to keep the application the exact same. The only thing we're adding to the system 
is plant diversity. So we'll use the, we're not going to adjust farms fertilizer rates at all. We're not going to adjust herbicide rates. Uh, the only thing we want to test at the end of the trial outside of um, some gorgeous pictures and uh, just general trial data like seeding dates and stuff is we're going to get a feed quality test. So that's protein on the corn intercrop versus protein and feed quality on the monocrop corn. And then of course, we need to show that we're not going to be reducing uh, corn yield or total biomass yield. So we will get a tonnage on this as well. And then we are also got three separate sites here in Manitoba where we are going to get pretty intensive with the testing. So we're going to be testing, as you can see, we did some trials last year on corn spacing. So try inserting some 60 inch spaces into a 30 inch cornfield to try and get those legumes established and have them infiltrate into the canopy from the 60 inch space. Uh, reduce corn populations, which is kind of the trial that we discussed we did in 2021 with the air seeder. Um, reduce fertilizer, which this is a big one and where I see some potential in the future, both reducing our need for synthetic fertilizer, but also increasing uh, the, the feed biomass that we can uh, feed to cattle. And we will be doing some no fertilizer trials um, just to see uh, how much we can reduce these inputs. Of course, that's gonna come with reduced corn population, but it'll be interesting to see where that works out. Uh, air seeded corn, forage soybeans and hairy vetch. So very similar to the trial we did this year, but just add the forage, forage soybeans. So them all at the same time. Uh, we are of course gonna soil test all this before and after, and we'll do some grazing days trial. So that'll be um, full corn, soybeans, vetch, uh, grazing trial, but also grazing after silage and uh, grazing after uh, a corn harvest. So trial partners, uh, we've got about 20 trial partners thus far spread across Western Canada, and we have a little bit of uh, forage soybean seed left. If you are growing monocrop corn and think this is even interesting in the slightest and want five acres of free seed in exchange for a feed test and a tonnage test and a couple pictures. Um, you can email us at info at covers and co. Um, if you want more than that, you got to speak to me really soon because um, <laughs> it seems to be going rather quickly. But yeah, if you're interested in doing some trials or this maybe makes sense, uh, you know, you could probably drop your name in the chat as well. But uh, yeah, we're looking for just a handful of, of new partners. Um, and yeah, that takes us to our question and answer uh, period. So Mitch, if you want to turn uh, your video and, and mic on, Kerwin, if you want to turn your, your mic on, I know your service um, isn't super. Uh, there we got stop share. So uh, I'll ask uh, this question. I know Mitch, this, uh, this is something that you have done. Oh, nice. Blue Jays are up three, nothing. That's great. Uh, has anyone ever planted vetch with oats or barley for harvest grain or even barley, oats, vetch, rye, or ryegrass? Um, so Mitch, I think you did something with, uh, oats and hairy vetch, but I know, uh, if you don't have much to add here, I can, I can, uh, talk about my experience with it. I've done barley a couple times, actually. Yeah. We did it one year. We did it. We mixed it, did about five pounds with a bushel and a half of barley seed and we did full fertilizer and that was something else <laughs> the, the vetch was very patchy but where there was vetch there was no barley and you couldn't swath it it was just dad was swathing it and he was yelling at me on the radio he was pissed off and out there with a knife cutting it off the reel and was rapping on the pea auger and it was just a disaster and the second time we did it, <clears throat> I actually did it as a nurse crop. We did maybe four or five pounds of vetch with our alfalfa seed and a bushel of barley, just as a, like a nurse crop, no fertility. And that worked way better. Like we got about, we didn't get nearly as many bushels of barley, but with no fertility and 65, 70 bushels of barley, that's pretty damn good. And to nobody believes me, but we did get vetch seed as well. And what'd you do with it? 
left it in the barley. <laughs> there wasn't that much. If I would have been scouting the field better and seeing that the vetch was potting, I would have left it another week, week and a half, and we would have got a lot more. But only the very, very earliest of it was mature. So, But you could see just the occasional black seed in there and then some pot, green pods. So if we would have left it another week or two, we would have lost some barley but gained the veg. Well, I in I can I believe you, Mitch, because I had the same thing in 2019. Uh, the same time you were struggling combining your corn, uh, I was struggling combining my uh, oats and vetch. And the oats were probably ready to combine about maybe the end of August, and there was virtually no vetch in it at all. And then we had two months of precipitation, and it turned into a vetch field. And there was actually. I don't know if it would have been worth it to clean out at, I mean, at the time that's what, you know, you were probably getting 75 cents for now it's, you know, probably tripled in price. Um, I'm sure now I would definitely be cleaning it out, but yeah, we did get some vetch seed in year one, but that was off a, a vetch crop that was out of this world. Like it was, <laughs> it, it, there was too much vetch. It took over, it took over the field, but yeah, we have seen it set some seed in year one. Um, but usually it's the, uh, 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 the, the following year where we're getting um, the vetch seed. Um, we got a question from one of the uh, pan or the uh, people that logged on earlier. Has anyone tried the, the V5 cropping, like either blowing or interseeding um, uh, an intercrop in? I know, Mitch, you talked about the, the PRG. Kerwin, have you ever tried actually intercropping anything other than vetch and after uh, herbicide? No, we've just done vetch for intercropping. That's it. Never really strayed too far from that yet. And I, yeah, to, to add to it, I have, I get invited. I'm very fortunate. So I get invited to lots of uh, farm intercrops that farms try. I, ha I have walked in quite a few corn intercrops, whether that's been broadcasted at V5 or interseeded at, at V4, V5. And it just, I know we showed that picture of to, so to prove we aren't biased, we showed that picture of, of Tom's turnip and radish. And those, I would say that is the best result that I have, have seen. And I'm sure that came with uh, a timely rain. And I'm not sure if he broadcasted it or seeded it in. But, you know, generally when it's buried under a canopy of corn and, and we need a pretty decent weather event to get those seeds germinated, you know, usually results aren't, are not fantastic. Um, we talk about, uh, uh, corn population. So maybe, uh, do you guys just want to touch on quickly what you've done, uh, with your corn intercrop? Kerwin, I know you just did it the, the one year last year. Um, but did you change your corn population at all? And Mitch, you've done it a few years. What, what have you done as far as, uh, corn population when you're intercropping batch? We've always stayed at 32. I've changed it a couple like a couple rows i'd maybe drop it but this year i know we're gonna try we're gonna do the bulk of the field at 32 but i am gonna do probably 10 or 20 acres at 27 just to get it down there and see what happens i've heard too many people say oh. that it works so i'm gonna give it a try sorry i lost you there for a bit yeah kerwin just wondering about um did you uh lower your plant population when you were sowing the vetch um Yes, no, and I guess in the future, um, if you were going to do it again, would you uh, would you lower the population, keep it the same, or or maybe even try some trials? Oh, we may have lost Kerwin, Mitch. <laughs> well, <laughs> I will say, though, I would probably never seed corn again with a drill. What I did see on the the trial that I did there. I would definitely be comfortable going down to 27, even maybe 25 from what on a dry year did well. Or yeah. And that, I mean that, I, I think that's the biggest uh, shame with the trial is, <clears throat> you know, we didn't learn a whole lot as far as, as corn plant population, because we had probably 60% of a corn plant there that we would have on a normal year. Eh? Yeah. But I think, I think the plant are still going to win. Yeah. Um, the extra, I think the planter, the precision with the planter will pay for the extra pass of the drill to put the vetch in. Yeah, because you're like in theory, 16,000 plants on average, 
they are going to average the 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 right spacing. The issue yeah. is is it's not a game of average. It's like you said, you might have three corn seeds here, and then you got a six foot radius where we don't have any corn plants at all. Yeah. So I don't know. That's just that was definitely my big takeaway from that this year was the planters. Even if you're dropping way down right to your 8,000, the planter would still beat it. I think so too. Uh, The other nice thing about the planter and what we were trying to figure out with the, uh, with the drill was where can we grow corn plants without affecting the growth of the intercrop at all? So where can sunlight access everywhere around a plant? I mean, the nice thing that's always guaranteed with the planter, especially if we're going North South is once today, that sun is going to be shining directly down that row. And that intercrop is going to be able to access at least some sunlight at some point in the day. Whereas, you know, with the, with the air seeder, I mean, at 32,000 plants, we knew what the result was going to be, but that's where where we were testing, you know, 12,000, 18,000. I mean, even 8,000, we knew was going to be too little, but just want, just to see even what it would look like to sow 8,000 plants of corn. You know, I expect them to be trees with three or four tillers, but I don't imagine, I didn't see that. I think it would have been, if we would have got rain, those would have been some scary plants. Yeah, I agree. And, and the other thing, I mean, now I'm remembering why, (laughs) why this trial wasn't so enticing to me was to see if we could access uh, more than one cob per plant. So my issue with corn is it's high lignin residue that really a cow, I mean, I won't say can't digest, but cannot digest efficiently at all almost to the point where it cannot digest it so it's like how can we get more corn digestible energy for every one high lignin corn stalk that a cow really can't efficiently digest so um yeah that was kind of the idea and with the uh with the air seeder if we really randomize and space these corn plants out are we going to be able to get uh, you know, two cobs per, per high lignin corn stalk. But that did, I mean, that there was, there were lots of plants I had that had two cobs, but not near, um, I think like eight, at 8,000, the 8,000 plants had, uh, a lot of them had, had two cobs, but I mean, Kerwin, I'm sure you'll agree. And, and, and Mitch as well, 8,000 corn plants is not very many plants per acre. I think that yeah, no, not at all. That was like four pounds to the acre, wasn't it, or something like that? I I yeah. shouldn't say with, I shouldn't say without numbers in front of me, but I well, and I'll tell you in 2021, you guys can agree with me. You can comfortably walk through 8,000 plants an acre and not hit a corn plant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can damn near combine 8,000 plants per acre with a combine and not hit a corn plant. <laughs> yeah uh is, okay so i got a question coming in here is the concern with the drill seed damage or precision so uh both you kind of touched on it but why don't we just touch on it one more time Kerwin, you if you can hear me okay um was your biggest concern with the with the drill precision or was it that you were busting corn seeds oh might have lost him again mitch it's on to you oh, it's fine um, due to poor communication between you and I, we put it actually ended up. Hang on, through. that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> we ended up using our uh, our plastic meter, and I didn't think we had too much damage going through the plastic auger. It was the it was the precision. It was hands down. You just have two or three seats come out, and then nothing, and it was just that's just an airflow. You can't yeah, I. I I would tend to agree with that. Like I, I, when looking at mine from uh, the drone video, I would almost swear that there was less corn seeds where my wing seeded. Like yeah. maybe the corn wasn't getting, <laughs> wasn't being pushed down there efficiently enough. Maybe I didn't have the right uh, airflow because how the hell would you know where to set that on, uh, you know, when you're, <laughs> I didn't want to set it too high for what Ker- Kerwin said, yeah. uh, you know, cracking seeds. But uh, yeah, was it, was like getting everything to the end yeah i don't i don't know and maybe it was a maybe it was an issue where it was so dry 
you know, I got better germination uh, where the cart ran over it because it packed better. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would tend to agree with you about <clears throat> the precision of a planter where it, I think it probably pays for the, for the extra pass. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely had that problem as well as the corn seed getting to the end of the air cedar wings too. I noticed that fairly obvious. I mean, it, this is weird. All three of us had the same shitty drill. Yeah. <laughs> <We're> cattle farmers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Grain farming. Grain farming for a cattle farmer brought to you by an 8800 Borgo drill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, and sorry, the question you asked me on the seed damage, mine was more going to the drill, I would say, just the augers cracking the corn kernels. Okay, um, I got a question here, you guys. How do you, are, are there any option, options other than vetch? So, of course, I touched on one. Um, I mean, the, the reason why uh, any are, the reason why vetch is so enticing and forage soybeans is so enticing is that we can establish them early, still use a herbicide in our crop, um, and hopefully get away with them, not competing for sunlight with, with the corn. The reason why so many people try V4, V5 is because usually you can spray, spread the crop on, and then, um, you know, hopefully your, your cover crop comes in. But I mean, you almost got to ask yourself a question when you're spraying at V4, V5, that's the last time you spray a herbicide and you know, your corn's going to stay weed free. Well, if the weeds aren't going to grow, you know, what are the chances that we're going to be able to establish a cover crop at the same time? The weeds aren't growing for the same reason your cover crop's not going to grow at that stage, if, if you know what I mean. Yep. Uh, how do you terminate the vetch without chemicals? Um, and then I, he, maybe he's organic, but, uh, oh, I think at the very least, uh, We'll start with you, Kerwin. What did I know? You haven't seen uh, haven't seen the vetch come back. But how about uh, in 2020 when you grew corn vetch? How did you terminate the vetch? Um, actually, I don't know. Just the cows. We just ran when we ran the cows over. They seemed to trample and eat it, and we didn't see a whole lot of vetch coming back the next year. And we grew. I oh, sorry, put it sorry, out. Yeah. Keep keep going. Well, Finish your thought if you want. Okay, sorry, no, the 2021, we had barley and oats on that same piece, and we seen seen very little vetch come back, but I obviously sprayed my barley and oats as well, right? With, yep. Mitch, what but, do you see for vetch regrowth after you <clears throat> kick the cows out? Nothing. The cows destroy it. I yeah. Think. I, I, and the, boy, I have some smart agronomists approach me and say, you've got to stop talking about this hairy vetch. It's glyphosate resistant. The whole country is going to be infested with hairy vetch. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, you've had nothing to do with hairy vetch. <laughs> we, even, even, uh, I mean, you kick the cows out for a week, they trim it off the end of November. I mean, I'm telling you that all those pictures you, you saw of my corn vetch after I, after the cows were out there, I bet you couldn't go find five living vetch plants the next spring. It's just the cows are the most effective herbicide on hairy vetch. It's amazing what the, the, what they'll do. And yeah, yeah. hairy vetch, Kerwin, you said it is a very effective or is crazy affected by most broadleaf herbicides. So if you're just spraying a generic broadleaf herbicide in a cereal crop, you are going to smoke the bejesus out of any hairy vetch. How many times have you tried to get hairy vetch to winter, Joe? Seven. How, How many, many times has it wintered? Okay. <laughs> exactly. Zero. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I wish <laughs> like hell I could get it to, I wish my whole farm was hairy vetch that I could combine. I would be a wealthy, wealthy person, but it just, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And I, I'll tell you a story. So that like those pictures of the, 60 inch corn trials that, that we show so often because there's so much damn potential there. Uh, the cows grazed it and last spring we sowed piola on it and it was so dry that nothing was growing. So we sowed the piola and I was gonna, I was gonna give it a pre-emergence burn off and uh, didn't, there was nothing growing. Uh, came to herbicide time, there was virtually no broadleaf pressure at all. So I just sprayed a uh, grassy leaf herbicide 
And you know how many vetch plants I had on that 70 acres? Maybe one. Like, like maybe one. And I actually, in my head, I thought, this is the year I'm going to grow hairy vetch seed because I'm going to put it with, with uh, peas and canola. The herbicides all match up and then I'll combine it and I'll get hairy vetch seed and separate it. One damn plant on 70 acres. So I, I would not worry about hairy vetch taking over your farm. And if you got cows, it, it would be very welcome to take over mine. Yeah. Uh, okay, here's a, here's a decent one, guys. I actually, I do have some experience with this. Uh, are the drills you're talking about hoe drills or disc drills? Does it make any difference? Um, of course, an 8800, uh, you guys know this, is a hoe drill. Um, just talk about, I guess, the disadvantages of the 8800 when sowing this practice. And we did some with our uh, disc drill as well. Um, and I can talk about that at the end. But Kerwin, why don't you talk about kind of the job uh, your 8800 did so in this? Yeah, like I, yeah, I think it does actually a pretty good job. Like we roll everything just because of the rocks, just in case we want to chop it or something. So it kind of covers your furrows in. And but if you are, if it if it's too heavy of trash, it definitely does drag and clump a little bit. But it's like he said like if in the heat of the day it just it just goes straight to the drill it seems like it's when you start early in the morning or go late in the night that's when you usually have the problems in too much trash but other than that it makes a very nice job Mitch I agree I mean I would love to switch to a disc because I'm just sick of losing so much moisture opening it up but mm -hmm. yeah it works it puts the seed in the ground the seed grows yeah uh, and in my experience, we bought a 750 uh, John Deere uh, single disc uh, drill. It does not work. <laughs> it, it was, we couldn't open up the cups wide enough to get the corn out. Literally, we opened up the cups so wide that vetch was just streaming out of the drill and we still couldn't get the corn to, to go out. We sowed a five acre piece and maybe had 10 corn seeds that that grew it was pretty pathetic if you had uh an auger metering system and air i assume it would work better but yeah i'm not sure it would be a huge difference but as you found out from the from the panelists tonight it's it's more about the precision and the spacing of of the corn and my brother-in-law will love to hear me say that so you're welcome scooter thanks for coming on <laughs> uh Okay, got, we got a couple of questions. I don't think either of you have tried this, but um, Mitch, you got a little bit of herbicide background. You might know the answer to this. Uh, wondering about open pollinated corn with hairy vetch or an intercrop, what we might spray and what would happen if we didn't spray anything at all. So we just grew corn and hairy vetch. Um, Mitch, we'll start with you. Then Kerwin, if you want to take a second to think what your crop would look like or if you did leave a check strip where you didn't spray at all, and then I have left some some unintended check strips that I can talk about. I think if you had a good catch of vetch, it would smother any crop, any weeds you had. Um, with the first year we did it, somebody said you could maybe go off label with Bazagran. Is that what it is, I believe? I think that is an option. Um, off label but they would not put their name to it if we smoked all the vetch they were yeah. definitely didn't advise it but from the one year the best year that we the best result we had that first year if you can get the vetch to really take off it's just going to kill everything else like it was dragging it was dragging kosher plants down and just killing them dead so so i i think you'd probably be okay I mean, I think if, I mean, if you could predict the weather, you probably wouldn't be farming, but yeah, if you could predict like the, we're off to a good start this year, no plant. And I'm sure Kerwin can attest to this and Mitch can attest to this. When you grow hairy vetch close to a low spot, you've never seen growth like that. Hairy vetch and moist or, or average to above average conditions is a phenomenally growing plant. It's just unbelievable how thick it comes in the low spots or the wet spots. So I, I definitely agree what Mitch is saying. 
However, it would really depend <laughs> like this year, uh, 2021, it was pretty pathetic how little Vetch um, was out there. Um, and I was extra hard on mine because I was a little aggressive with my, my herbicide trying to get some foxtail, but it was, you know, I've been doing this. I think it's six years. I've grown uh, corn vetch intercrop either five oh, time flies. It, I think it has been six years. Um, 2021 was by far the worst. And that was because it was by far the driest other outside of that. Usually we can get away with one herbicide pass and the vetch is established. We get any precipitation at all. It's like Mitch said, it just takes over everything else. And ideally it does it before um, any of those things set seed. Kerwin, curious what you've seen as far as. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like the vetch, like if it gets moisture, you, you're, you're not going to compete with that. Like it's almost drags the corn down. I find if the corn isn't tall enough in those situations, you know, yeah, that's um, that's he talked about what open pollination corn. I've actually grown open pollination corn once, but it was just monocrop then. And I just cultivated it and it worked really great. Actually, I had good success with it. Never sprayed it at all, but never did put vetch in there. But I think if there's vetch and we've got moisture, no weeds going to compete with the vetch. And I think you'd be fine. I should tell a story too about, uh, I did a 35 acre trial or a 70 acre field. I split in half 35 acres, got two glyphosate passes, uh, uh, 35 acres got one. Um, and it just happened to be, it was, uh, uh, millet was high pressure and without a doubt, after the first pass of, uh, glyphosate on the pass that didn't get, or on the, the side that didn't get two passes, there was significantly less vetch because the millet just in the heat of the summer, we had bare soil, um, which is a no, no on my part. Um, but the vetch out competed or the millet out competed the vetch. And we did not see, um, we actually saw better results where we had two glyphosate passes versus one. Um, but with that being said, just like the guy said, if, if we get regular precipitation or, or heaven help us above average precipitation, I mean, the vetch is going to thrive like no crop, like nothing else that will grow in your field. Um, guys, we're coming up. We got about five minutes left here. Um, just want to uh, give you guys the opportunity. You've talked lots about what you want to do with uh, corn intercrop um, going forward, but I know you guys both have cows and Mitch, you're a grain farmer, cattle farmer, just like me and Kerwin, you're doing lots of interesting stuff. Um, I'll give you a, a couple minutes each to talk about kind of a, an intercrop that you're excited about to whether it doesn't have to be next year, but maybe sometime in the future, something that you're thinking about, you want to implement in your farm that would work good in your system. So Kerwin, why don't we start with you? Then we'll go with Mitch and uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take the final word as I usually do. Yeah, no, um, I, I had got watching some videos too on YouTube and I, thought radishes and turnips in between the corn rows for intercropping would be super I don't know it seems like the cows love those in the full seasons when they go in to graze them and to me it all it looks like they can create a lot of biomass on the ground and a lot of ground cover so that's something that I'm definitely going to try going forward as well and I'm definitely sure I'll brainstorm something else up to put in between here but we'll see what happens that's great isn't it fun like how boring is monocrop corn? Do you know, Kerwin? Well, yeah, exactly. It's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're young. You are much, much younger than both Mitch and I. <laughs> you got I, lots I of learn from our mistakes. Yeah, I just, I just look at it. It's never a failure, really, because you're always improving your soil. Whether you put more than just one crop, like species, in, right? That's whether that whether your cows get a lot of it it can always benefit you big time next year. I think. Well said my friend, Mitch, what crazy ideas are you working on? Well, I don't have too many. Um, I was watching one of your webinars a few last, last week or the week before. And uh, I'm definitely interested in that flax wheat that somebody's doing that definitely piqued my interest. Probably I'd like to get around to trying a bit more piola 
see if I 2019 didn't work out so well for us and it kind of gave me a sour taste. And I've always wondered, we've had, I wouldn't say good luck with soybean and canola racks for volunteer canola, but I've often wondered why soybean and canola wouldn't work. So I might try some of that. I actually, I think Alex Borsch is on the podcast or on the webinar tonight and he has tried it. Um, so I can hook you up with the contact, Mitch, because I, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a, a really simple and easy way to implement <clears throat> a cover crop, simple to separate and right. We're checking a few different boxes off. Yep. I think timing's an issue. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to one that I've talked about earlier and Mitch, you were actually involved with the debacle that it was. Uh, love the idea of 30 inch soybeans and going back in a month later uh, with millet, harvesting it together, leaving the, the straw in windrows and then swath grazing the windrows. Um, I had an issue last year with herbicide timing and I didn't have a disc drill. Um, I think soybeans on 30 inch spacing and going say on the 15th of May, going in on the 15th of June with you know, 60% millet seed and maybe some intercrop after the last herbicide pass on the soybeans to, to grow between the row of the soybeans, capture more sunlight, you know, utilize some of that nitrogen being provided by the soybeans, simple to separate and hopefully a viable feed source for, for our cows. Um, and then to stay on, on uh, theme for tonight, I'm crazy excited to see how this corn intercrop um, and forage soybeans works out. I think there's a real opportunity here and especially to my cattle farming brethren, I don't know how we're going to survive putting $1.60 a pound nitrogen on corn. It's just these inputs are so crazy and our commodity is not worth <laughs> the equivalent to 25 bushel or $25 per bushel uh, canola. So I think it's uh, the best time to start thinking differently and try and be creative produce as much high quality biomass as we can for the least amount of money. And that's what, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to keep trialing and keep working on because I think there's some real potential here. So guys, thank you very much for taking up your Monday night. You guys were excellent. Lots of good information there. Um, I hope everyone on learned something and uh, much appreciated to you, Kerwin and you, Mitch. And uh, yeah, I guess this is the last webinar we're going to do. So we won't see you again until I don't know, maybe January next year, maybe February. We'll see when uh, when uh, Trav wants to put all these together again. So thank you for watching. Uh, appreciate the support and all the uh, questions we get after the fact. And hopefully we can answer some questions and try and tie some people together in this soil health plant diversity movement. Um, I'm glad people are enjoying it and we will for sure be back next year. So thanks again, guys. Have a good night and uh, cheers to you. Great job. Thanks.